So hello, everybody. Uh, my name is April, and welcome to the Reproducibility for Everyone webinar series that we're running um, with the ECR uh, Tanzania um, group. Uh, everyone's welcome, whether you're part of that group or not. Uh, today is the second in the series. You can find the first one on YouTube, and this one will go up on YouTube as well afterwards. You'll see some uh, links there on the first slide. The first is to the slide deck, so feel free to um, follow along with the slides. Also, you can reuse these um, yourself if you want to use them as a reference or to run your own version of this for uh, any lab mates or colleagues that you have. Uh, the second is the shared notes document that the tool is uh, sharing in the chat as well. Um, and that is just a little place where people can um, write their thoughts, their questions and their comments here. Um, and uh, we can keep an eye on that to respond to comments and questions. And you all can also answer um, questions and comments during the workshop itself. It'll also give you a little sense of um, the topics we're going to discuss. Um, and then finally, we have a link to a handout, and that's a list of resources created by the Reproducibility for Everyone community, which is a group of researchers from around the world. Um, and everything that we're going to talk about is stuff that those researchers themselves have identified as helpful for improving reproducibility in their lab. Uh, all right, so I'm going to admit this last person here, and uh, I'm going to get started, Batul, so if you can admit anyone that comes after this, that'd be great. Absolutely. Awesome. Great. So I'm April. I am now currently working with the Reproducibility for Everyone community as the coordinator, and um, you can reach out to me uh, here if you have uh, questions or comments after the uh, webinar. So let's start with the thank yous. Um, one of our co-founders, uh, Dr. Benjamin, Benjamin, <laughs> Benjamin Schwessinger, um, helped to produce a lot of these materials. Um, and we also have sponsors from Chan Zuckerberg and AdGene. Um, you can reach out to us uh, through our email here. And we also have a website um, that has a lot of additional materials if um, you want to learn more. We also have a preprint available that goes over all the work we've done since 2018. Um, we're a large group and we're always looking for new members to come and to add their thoughts and their experience. So uh, reach out if you wanna join our community. Great, so let's dive in. Uh, as we talk about reproducibility in the Reproducibility for Everyone um, community, we organize it into these four facets of reproducibility. So these four sort of toolboxes. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about um, analysis and um, a little bit about dissemination and uh, sharing the materials you use in the lab. So uh, I am using the term reagent sharing when we talk about this section. But you'll notice that we're also talking about cell lines. We're talking about mice and flies and other animal models that people use. We're talking about plasmids, um, any substance or mixture um, that you would use in chemical analysis or in a wet lab. So this is uh, essentially the materials sharing side. And then Batul will introduce herself and talk a little bit about the methods sharing side um, by sharing protocols. So remember, you can ask questions um, in the chat or in the shared notes doc, and uh, we'll be sure to, to answer. We're a small group, so don't feel shy. Um, ask as many questions as you want. So why should we think about sharing our wet lab materials and reagents? Um, one of the issues we have currently is that uh, when people publish a paper, they often say that their materials are available upon request. Um, and then what happens in the real world is that people shift labs, they move, they change jobs, and the materials might remain in, a, um, in an institution, in a lab, in a freezer or something like that. But oftentimes these freezers look a lot like this photo on the far right. They're not necessarily organized in a very like professional way. They're not easy to retrieve. People that were not um, in the lab when the materials were created might not know which materials are which. 
Um, so when a scientist uh, has the request uh, that they would like to reuse uh, the materials used in their original paper, it's really hard for somebody to find it. Um, and then there's a lot of work that goes into actually sharing that reagent with the uh, other uh, scientists who would like to reproduce that work. So that's why it's important when we talk about reproducibility is because when you're reproducing someone's work, um, you would want to be reusing as many of the materials uh, that the original study used and not have to remake the wheel every time because remaking these materials sometimes is very time consuming and sometimes it's very difficult. Um, so there was a study from uh, the NIH uh, quite a while ago, and hopefully this is starting to change for the better since it was published, um, uh, talking about uh, mice. So mouse lines are used in a lot of different kinds of research. Cancer research is a common one. Um, and they found that a lot of these mice lines are not available in repositories. So when people are trying to reproduce someone else's work that's using these mice lines, they might contact that original researcher and they're oftentimes not able to get access to those mice lines. So um, oftentimes they need to be remade from scratch um, and if you're working in that field, you know that's a very expensive thing to do, and it can take years to get it right. Uh, so um, that's why we want to include this section into our Reproducibility for Everyone workshop, because uh, I think that many uh, researchers aren't aware that there are repositories for these types of materials, and that these can improve the reproducibility of your work, but it can also save a lot of time and money you can request mouse lines that you've used in your research from these repositories yourself. So this is a way that you can actually improve the reproducibility of your lab and help onboarding new people into your studies and um, have these repositories manage the organization of these materials. Um, and at the same time, while you're getting that benefit, so are all the other researchers that want to redo your study. So in this case, we're talking about mouse lines, but that also covers any of the other wet lab materials that you might be using, um, including flies, including cell lines, things like that. Um, so this sort of came to a head in um, a, a large uh, a study that was done trying to replicate high impact cancer papers. Um, so these were preclinical papers that were used to study uh, cancer, oftentimes in mice. Um, there was a, a team of labs that came together to try and produce the same um, findings in these papers. And their initial protocol, their initial plan was to replicate 50 of the papers. Uh, and what they found in their time frame. And with the resources they had, they had to cut that down to replicating just 18. And the bulk of the problems that they had there was that they couldn't get enough information and materials from the original authors to replicate those studies. So it's a really big problem in reproducibility, even with the big papers, with the big labs. So um, that's just to set out the problem. So what, um, what often happens is that you have someone that is requesting um, the reagents and they're writing to the corresponding author who has to do all this work. They have to track and store reagents. They're probably not trained to do that. They have to authenticate the reagents. So they need to make sure the thing they're sending out is the thing they think that they're sending out and that something hasn't happened to it. Um, and they need to distribute the reagents to the requesting researchers. They're required to be able to do that. So it's a lot of labor. Um, so that's why we want to talk about how you can share your materials using repositories. So what repositories allow you to do is to access materials more quickly, um, to authenticate reagents and maintain quality control. So these are people who are trained to do exactly these things, and um, they can do it quickly and it can keep up to date with the best practices, and you don't have to worry about keeping up to date on those best practices. 
um, they can curate them and standardize the reagent information. So that just means the data about the materials. So it means more people can discover them, means more scientists can actually reuse your paper, which could actually mean that you would have um, more citations. Uh, so if you want to frame any of these things in terms of advantages to yourself, I think those are the important things to keep in mind. This makes it easier for your lab, but it also makes it easier for other scientists to actually build upon your work, which means that you'll get more visibility, more people will um, benefit, and more people will cite your work. Um, and they can also deal with the nitty gritty boring stuff of shipping things, which is not always easy when you're talking about um, some of these materials that will require special um, you know, shipping, especially if it's international. So um, when we're talking about reagent sharing, we also have to think about how we're sharing the information about our reagents, so our materials that we use in the lab. So this also applies to chemicals that you're using, any materials that you're using. You want to make sure that you are um, citing your resources in ways that uh, ensure that you're citing that specific unique material and people won't accidentally use something similar. Um, and uh, that's why uh, it's important to uh, record the process um, that was used to create the reagent. Again, you want to authenticate, you want to confirm, you want to sequence the genome, whatever it is that you have to do to authenticate that this is what you think it is. You want to make sure you provide all the publications and protocols that you used. Um, you want to use uh, descriptive and standardized naming conventions. So look at how other people in your um, field are, uh, what uh, information they're providing in order to identify their materials. You want to do that plus more. You want to also add what's called a research resource identifier. So it's called an RRID. And um, this is a, a uniquely um, a unique identifier for individual resources. So this will track if there's changes over time as well. So sometimes you have a material that is called something and then the actual uh, material itself changes over time. This RRID, when you include it, it will be specific to that version of the uh, material that you used. You also want to include any catalog, catalog number, um, dates are useful too. Um, uh, as much information as you can. Anybody who attends any of our fuller workshops understands that a lot of reproducibility comes to down to this reporting as much description as you can about uh, what you did. And then finally, take that information and deposit it in a repository. And one of the nice things about a repository is they will help you with this list of things. They will help you make sure that you're doing all this right. So they're the professionals, they'll prompt you and say, actually, you need to include your RID, actually, you need to do this. So they can help you with um, learning this stuff for the first time. So the, there are a lot of benefits to depositing your materials in a repository. It archives them, um, it saves you time and money, and it ensures that there's quality control. So what it means is if you're able to do something successfully in the lab and someone else tries to reproduce your work, they're more likely to be successful in reproducing that work. Um, it also allows people to um, broaden who can use their work. So it means it's accessible to uh, people that are using it for teaching, for people that are using it for educational purposes. It can promote your work because it makes it more visible and discoverable for people that are um, you know, looking through the repositories. And um, it allows uh, for people to understand what reagents are being uh, reused. So if you come up with something that's really, really useful, that's another thing you can point to in terms of impact. You can say, look, my, my lines were accessed all over the world by thousands of researchers. Here's my number. You can actually point to how many times it's been reused. So um, uh, there are a lot of different repositories and it's great to, uh, use the ones that are um, either affiliated with uh, the, the types of materials you're using or the types of organisms that you're using, because that means their labs specialize in those. So these are just some examples. 
Um, we have ones that specialize in reagents, ones that specialize in flies, ones that specialize in mice, um, ones that specialize in zebrafish. So all of the main uh, animal models that people are using, there's a repository available for, uh, for that. Um, AdGene is a plasmid repository. Um, it's nonprofit and it's free to deposit. And that's true for most repositories. So keep that in mind. Um, do some research and see which repository meets your needs, but don't think that it's gonna be expensive to deposit because oftentimes depositing is free. So um, we'll, we'll just leave that here as a reference for you. Uh, in summary, um, whenever you think about improving the reproducibility in a wet lab, think about all the materials that you use. Think about how you can increase access and speed up the reproducibility of um, rerunning those studies by depositing all those materials in a repository. Make sure that you are documenting all the details about the materials that you're using, including using RRIDs, and um, deposit them and um, you know, reap the benefits of having more people be able to reuse your work and increase the impact of that awesome work that you're doing. So uh, feel free to ask questions in the chat and in the shared notes doc, and I'm passing you on to Batul. Thanks, Batul. Yeah, thank you, April, for the awesome introduction about reagent sharing. Uh, I am Betul al Murzuk. I am a communication biologist. This is my Twitter account. Please feel free to reach out at any time with any kind of questions. So hopefully this is going to work. So can you move the slide, April? It doesn't work for me. So I'm going to talk to you guys about uh, organizing and sharing your protocol and how can that improve your documentation and by protocol i mean is a recipe describing how you did yours today if you are a computation biologist like me this could mean a workflow could you also move the slides uh, april please yeah, so before I start, I would love to ask you guys, where do you find your protocol? So if you're just a master's student or a PhD student or a postdoc, where do you usually go to find your protocol? If you can share that in the etherpad and I'll give you a moment to write it down, that would be great. So time just started now. Okay, so, so most people do find their vertical in the literature. They go and find a paper, they have the same, they use the same study, they use the same vertical, and that's where most people find their vertical. But I'm going to speak about the challenging of doing so. Um, some people, they ask a lab member to see if one of their colleagues have used similar vertical. I used to go to ResearchGate. I used to post lots of questions there. There's a bunch of uh, very friendly people who would answer me. Some people, they ask experts in the field. Oh, they try to reinvent the wheel and create the protocol by themselves. What I want to talk about in this short talk is about repository and the advantage of using and sharing your protocol in a repository. Can you move the slide, April, please? So here is a really common experience. This is a tweet by Morgan Helen, who is a postdoc at QC Riverside, and who said, uh, looking for a protocol 1997 paper as described in 1996, then find the 1996 paper and says it's described in 1987 paper. And then when you find the 1987 paper, it's a paywall. This is a very common experience and very frustrating. When I started as a PhD student, um, I used to look for lots of protocol, and I thought I'm not a good scientist because I can't find a good protocol in the literature. But then I found out that many other scientists have the same experience. And this is not just limited for biologists, it's also for physicists, other disciplines. You can move the slides, uh, April, please. So this is also a tweet by physicists who was looking for methodology say device that was fabricated as previously described, then again as previously described, and again as previously described. And then when he reached the original paper, it says device that was fabricated with a conventional method. 
So good luck finding out what was the method that we used. Um, and this is because simply we keep our protocol hidden in a piece of paper floating somewhere in the bench or in our notebook, but it can be really, really tricky to figure out what kind of protocol we use, how we fine tune it, how we optimize it. And this can save you a huge amount of time. Uh, this is another experience of my own when I started my PhD. I have also I was working with this protein of interest uh, that two of the postdocs who used to be in the lab have worked with it, but none of them have left like a detailed protocol. So I have to recreate it on my own and then optimize it. And that took about six months, which could be otherwise easily saved with my VHD. And um, I love this interesting blog post. Uh, if you can move the slide, please, uh, April. This is a very interesting uh, blog post uh, coming from ecologist and professor in Canada who say that our method in journals and in papers are often like this analogy of a drawing an owl. Step one, it drew two circles. Step two, it drew the rest of the owl. And this is supposed to be a step-by-step -step guide for drawing this beautiful owl, but it simply doesn't help at all. The only way I can reproduce this owl is by trial and error. And this is also another six months of a trying. If you can move the slide, April, please. So there is a shift uh, from different publishers, uh, from different journals, by recommending people and scientists to deposit their protocol in a repository rather than using supplements in the paper. And this is an article by the scientist who says the push to replace journal supplement with the repositories. And there are many reasons to do that. And when I say repository, if you're not familiar with this term, it means a place where you can deposit your protocol with all kinds of steps, details necessary for someone else to come and replicate the same protocol. It also gives you a present, a present <coughs> sorry, an idea for the protocol itself, so others can come in, use the protocol, and cite you as well. And this article by the scientists emphasized how difficult it can, find, it can be to find the right method if on place that you can find it is described within the supplement file, uh, because simply the supplement file is not easily searchable. So if you can move the slide, please, April. So the best of practice is to share in repositories. And here are a few examples of repository. We can deposit your protocol. Uh, there is others like Zenerdia, but um, we are highlighting in this because uh, the first one is protocol exchange, which is hosted by Nature Research, protocol IO, plus one, because simply these allow versioning. And by versioning, I mean you can make an adaptation or someone else can come and change something very simple, but make a separate version and cite you inside it. So this is really helpful, particularly when you optimize your protocol and use the same protocol for different species for different uh, organisms. Or sometimes uh, you can come after a year, you want to use exactly the same protocol, but some of the reagent you can't buy anymore. So you change the name of this reagent or where you buy it, where you, <laughs> did you buy it from? And this is extremely important for others to come when they want to replicate the same methodology. So um, if you can move the slide, April, please. So one of the benefits of adding your protocol to a common knowledge base like a protocol IO is that here's a story from a researcher from Chile who was asking at Twitter if anyone had an RNA extraction protocol for cortical neuron cultures. Um, so he wanted to do this RNA extraction for a particular culture, but he couldn't find it. And then someone else from Answer It Out, if you can move the slide, please. Yeah, then someone else from, uh, someone else uh, came in and he's a boss from UCTF. Uh, she's Alina and she says, there's a few version in protocol IO, but I would use this basic trisol protocol. Uh, and she linked it exactly here in the slide. And it should work. And this is really interesting because um, if you go, if you can move the slide, please, April. Yeah. So this is very interesting because in the paper, if you go to the original paper, it 
what's described there is not about cortical neurons. It's basically about free spine stickle barocyte fish. But because the author of this paper, they deposit the vertical in a vertical IO, not, the, not just they made the paper reproducible, but also they made it easier for other scientists to find the vertical and reproduce it and use it and then cite it in other, uh, in other papers. If you can move the slides, please, April. Yeah. So sharing your protocol can increase discoverability because as I said, if you add it just to the supplement file, it's really difficult to find that protocol. It's just hidden in some supplement file that's not easy searchable. It also increases reproducibility, it facilitates research connection, it enables reuse, and it actually enhances the value of research. And the value of research is the something that we are as a research and academia, this is what we're supposed to do. Uh, thank you so much. And then I'm going to give it back to April to wrap it up now. Uh. Right. Um, there's just one more uh, yeah. section on protocols. It's just a, an overall how to um, write and share a protocol. So this is a good reference for folks who are doing this for the first time, you want to think about it as a standalone publication, because some people are going to discover it in the repository itself and need to reuse it that way. So you want to have an abstract that allows people to understand what they can use it for, and then you want to include as much detail as possible. So you can take a look at this, as well as these links below on the slide if you want to try writing your protocol for the first time. And one of the things that ties together the protocols sharing and the material sharing together is that um, it's good practice to deposit um, anything that you use uh, and it's free to do so in almost all cases. So it's really just a win-win for everybody involved and it can save you like a ton of time and money. So uh, in summary, reproducible research can help you stay organized. Um, and uh, you can find materials, you can find your protocols when you need them. It helps you share all those amazing things that you are doing, all that hard work optimizing your protocols, all that hard work getting your mouse lines to work. Um, it allows you to be more accurate because um, you know everything's authenticated, you know everything is what you think it is, you're more consistent with how you run your protocol. Um, and it allows you to share your results with future researchers, including your future self or future lab mates that come onto your lab after you leave. So um, all the things that we talked about here can save you time um, and they can benefit you. Don't be overwhelmed if it's all new. Um, nobody does this overnight. So see what you think is most applicable to your problems and try that out. And reach out to us if you have any questions. Um, a lot of uh, these uh, materials are things that researchers in our community themselves have experience with. So we always love to hear from people that have uh, questions like that. Um, so everything that you saw here, all the slides, all the materials are openly licensed. Um, and I encourage you to reuse them if you find them useful. Um, again, a shout out to the people that helped us do this. Um, we're a small group and we've um, had the good luck of having a few groups um, help us along the way, including uh, these sponsors. And then finally, uh, let us know what you liked, what you didn't like about uh, our materials, about our webinar. We're always happy to um, to hear back, we update our materials regularly. So uh, yeah, with that, we're at time. Um, I'm happy to stay around for a few minutes if everybody has, if anyone has questions.